the, the Saudis are ultimately going to have to do uh, what they must to keep their biggest client happy. And their biggest client by far is China. Um, and so I think it's inevitability and inevitability um, that you get some sort of concession in terms of China being able to, the Saudis selling oil to China in Yuan. Then the question becomes, do we ever hear about it? And if there's, and, and if we do hear about it, what are the implications? All right. Hey, everyone. Welcome to the show. Uh, we're here with Luke Roman. Luke, um, the Alec Baldwin of the uh, Investors Podcast. When, and when I say that, I'm saying the SNL, you know, how Alec Baldwin hosted <laughs> SNL so many times. It's you. <laughs> it's you. It's, I'm not going to shoot you. <laughs> so what's your... Uh, What's your overview? What's your market overview? We're recording this on 12 January, uh, 2022. What's your overview of how you're seeing the market? And just for context, we just found out that the CPI came in at 7% today. Um, 10 year treasuries at what? 1.7%. Um, boy, oh boy. What, let, let's hear it. What's your overview? Yeah. So I, I, I'm of a, a couple of different minds, I guess, a little bit. And, and first off, uh, thanks for having me on and, and happy birthday to you. I'm, uh, I, I don't you. know what you're doing on with, with me on your birthday, but happy birthday, my friend. Um, but I, I'm, I'm of a couple minds. I, I came, came out of last year and into early this year with the view that I disagree. There's, it seems to be a lot of people think this is just another rate hiking cycle. And I, I think there are a lot of things that are very, very different. And, and so, for example, uh, something I wrote uh, a couple of uh, weeks ago or a week and a half ago or so, I, I highlighted like the tightening cycle is occurring in the context of a bunch of things that no one alive has ever invested through. So, for example, um, obviously, we're in our first pandemic recovery in 50 to 100 years, uh, something we've been talking about for ad nauseum is, is I think we're living through the first bursting global sovereign debt bubble in a hundred years. And we think you're going to need negative real rates uh, on a sustained basis, increasingly negative to make global sovereign debt and fiscal positions and entitlement obligations in the West in particular sustainable. Uh, third thing is you've got, uh, what we've been writing a lot about over the last year, something that we call peak cheap energy and metals, and you're seeing not that we're running out of energy and metals, but the ore grades needed to address the levels of, of demand uh, are going to likely require significant upticks in price. You're going to have a real sort of sustained inflationary impulse from, uh, from commodity and metals markets in a way that we probably haven't seen in some time. Uh, something we started writing about late last year, um, it's long been known that the Chinese uh, have water issues, uh, water constraints. They've been talking about it for 10, 15 years. Uh, there's been a number of U.S. policymakers talking about it for 10, 15 years. There's a, a lot of signs that have begun emerging in the second half of 2021 that those water constraints in China are becoming acute. And to be blunt, if, if China has a water problem, China has a power problem. And if China has a power problem, the world has a power problem and the world has an inflation problem since China's a world's factory. And that's something sort of these inflation is transitory crowd uh, I think are, are missing is it both peak cheap energy and metal and these Chinese water constraints. Um, I think this this sort of new Cold War, if you will, that some people are calling it. I think uh, a lot of people are still looking at that through this lens of I, I think a lot of the economists are completely discounting it like it doesn't exist. Um, a, a, a Cold War with the biggest uh, commodity consumer in the world, the biggest factory in the world, the biggest trading partner of everybody in the world. And, and it's just like, well, hey. We're sort of, you know, snapping our fingers and tapping our heels and, and the supply chain problems are going to go away. And, you know, meanwhile, we're in this new Cold War, pseudo Cold War, if you will, with that with that trading partner. Um, and it's a Cold War that people are still most people I read are still um, evaluating based on the lens of the USSR. Uh, a lot of times I find, hey, well, well, there was a Cold War. We won that. Well, there was a reason why the baby boom generation didn't offshore our manufacturing to the USSR. <laughs> and, and we never fought that Cold War once, you know, in a, in a position where uh, the USSR had a quorum of our manufacturing. And, and there's a great book I was reading over um, the, uh, the holiday break by Rush Doshi, or at least excerpts of it. I started it. 
um, uh, I think it's called the long game. Uh, at any rate, he highlights that all in, in the last hundred plus years, all of America's adversaries, World War I, Nazi Germany, Imperial Japan, the USSR at the height of their power, none of them in singularly or in aggregate ever uh, had an economic clout such that their GDP was 60% or more of the United States' GDP. And China hit that level in 2014. So we're eight years past. So we're dealing with a different animal. And so the way that manifests, I think these trade issues, supply chain issues, I think are probably going to be much stickier than people think. They're just not factoring in sort of the geopolitical angle of that. And then I think within all this as well, something that our friend Jeff Booth talks about a lot, obviously he made this concept famous uh, in his book, uh, The Price of Tomorrow, which is, if you haven't read it out there, uh, a brilliant, short, easy read. You, you have to read it. Uh, but it's into all of this, we have a, a, a technology that is moving faster and faster, enforcing deflation on the system, which is a problem because the system is debt backed and needs uh, exponential inflation. And so you've got sort of this this cocktail of things that nobody's ever seen really singularly, let alone in aggregate, all coming together. Uh, you still have a U.S. balance of payments problem. Well, you're going to have that because it's the way the system works. We run these massive current account deficits. Uh, foreigners are not buying enough treasuries um, relative to what we're emitting. And so the Fed's going to try to tighten into this. And so when I came into this year, and, and even finishing last year was really kind of looking at these things um, and just thinking the Fed's making a policy mistake that they, they, they should not be tightening. They need to let inflation run hot. The politics are getting in the way. Um, uh, Democrats are worried about midterms and, and, and the inflation. And, and I get it. Uh, but the, the, the Fed's doing the wrong thing by tightening. Um, and that is sort of a wow, lot that's, su that's super. Uh contrarian to everything you'll hear out in the markets, that there's a massive policy error being made with them saying they're, they're going to tighten. You're saying they're making the right decision by doing nothing. I think they should do nothing. I, th I think they should absolutely let inflation run hot. And the reason I say that is, is we know the World War II playbook, right? We, we saw last time debt, get, debt to GDP got this high. They let inflation run hot. They capped yields. Uh, from 46 to 51 U.S. debt to GDP went from 110% to 55%. U.S. real rates went as low as negative 14% um, and, and were negative pretty much that whole time or certainly the vast majority of the time. And, and by taking the debt to GDP from 110% to 55%, what it did is it, it delevered the system where the Fed could then normalize policy without blowing things up. And that's what needs to happen again, even more so now because uh, there's more debt, the dollars, uh, it's, it's not a gold back system. It's a debt back system. We've got the Euro dollar system. There's all these reasons why it's way more important now for the fed to let inflation run hot, to delever it before is that they, if they tighten before they delever enough, um, they'll blow up, they'll blow up markets, they'll blow up the system. And this is where it starts to get really interesting. And I don't, I don't mean to interrupt you there. Um, this is where it gets really interesting is because if you look, you know, we were taught, you and I talked about this probably a year ago at this time, real rates have to get much more negative. They did. Debt to GDP went from a high of 135% in late 2020 down to 122%. So we've actually gone from 135 to 122. So it's not the 110 to 55 that we did after World War II in five years, but we've made progress. Now the challenge, the scary thing on some level is going from 135 to 122 took 7% CPI, it took, it, it broke supply chains, Re letting inflation and demand run this hot to try to delever the U.S. government's balance sheet completely broke supply chains in part because they're all so stretched now, right? We're not making Wouldn't you say that the supply that. chains broke and caused the 7% CPI print? I see, um, it, I see it kind of a little bit in reverse where I think a lot of the COVID policies and things like that were actually causing a breakdown in supply chains. And then that caused prices to go up, which then gave you the CPI prints. Or do you think it's- I think, no, I think, it, I think it's fair. But I think the key takeaway, it almost doesn't matter chicken or egg, which came first, is that running the economy that hot as we did with the COVID stimulus and all this stuff, the supply chain can't handle it. The system yeah, breaks true, down. True. It's you know, a, yeah, it's both of those things. Yeah, we you know, so they 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 on, on one level they need to let this inflation run hot, but the supply chains aren't working with it running this hot. Now, the flip side to all of this that has really started to evolve in my way of, of thinking just in the last 
you know, more recently, last couple of weeks is I've been watching the dollar trade down with real rates rising in the last week, week and a half. I've been watching gold rise with real rates rising sharply in the U.S. Uh, off the lows. Um, and neither of these things should be happening. And I was kind of scratching my head a little bit about why that could be the case. And all of a sudden it hit me, I had an epiphany. I went back to something that I watched at the time, I wrote about it at the time, but last May, um, Stan Druckenmiller, uh, obviously a legendary investor, and I think um, maybe even a more legendary FX trader. I mean, the man is unbelievable in FX, yeah. right? Yeah. Um, he gave this incredible interview on CNBC in, in May of last year, May of 2021. And in it, he lays out the case that once we get on the other side of the pandemic, once you start to have this recovery, um, you're going, he actually, even to back up, he lays out the whole case. Look, foreigners aren't buying enough of our treasuries. Um, instead they've been buying us tech stocks, right? So we run these massive deficits and instead of sterilizing us deficits via treasury buying, they've been sterilizing deficits by buying us stocks and in particular us tech stocks. And his point was that whenever we get on the other side of the recovery of the pandemic and Fed starts to tighten, you're going to get sort of this traditional recovery, um, cyclical, re, you know, so sector rotation, you know, out of tech into commodities, cyclicals, banks, value, right? Why pay up for growth when the underlying economy is going to recover and grow? Classic sector rotation. What Druckenmiller's point was is that's going to be terrible for the dollar because the U.S. is still going to run the deficits. So much of it is structural. Um, and they're not buying enough treasuries. They, they, it's, they almost can't, um, certainly not with the dollar valued where it is, uh, but they're not. And so they have been sterilizing it with buying tech, but if they start moving money out of tech, that means capital flows that are helping finance these deficits, sterilize these deficits, start flowing elsewhere on the margin and the release valve turns into the dollar. And so it's interesting in just the last week, week and a half, I've been watching the dollar trade down when the dollar should absolutely be trading up. Everyone in the world is like, and I, I would have been right there with them as of a week and a half. The dollar should be going up. Everybody's long the dollar. Everybody's selling yields. Um, and yet the dollar's falling aggressively uh, in the last several days. And so I think there, I'm really, uh, to answer your question, coming to this year, we're at, I'm, of, I'm of these two minds. One is, it is absolutely unlike any other cycle we've ever seen. And so you can sort of throw out a lot of the playbooks. But you've also got sort of this view of, um, the, the, the tech or the rotation out of tech could be really bad for the dollar and, and feed on inflation, right? If the dollar gets weaker, that's only going to put more upward pressure on inflation and force the Fed to tighten more, which is going to sort of, you know, it, 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 it's a very interesting dynamic. So if, if Brent was here, Brent would be throwing a, you know, something at the screen and saying, but Luke, the, the dollar has been up for the last, you know, year, this is just a standard volatility move in the, it, since the start of 2022, uh, what would you say back to that? You might be right. Um, yeah. You know, it's, it's too quick to tell, but, you know, with all due respect to Brent, if I had to listen to Brent or I had to listen to Stan <laughs> Druckenmiller on currencies, uh, I'd be listening to Stan Druckenmiller. And when you look at the flows and I've looked at the flows, like it makes sense of, you, you can see the treasuries aren't being bought, right? They, you, know, we, you know, we're running the deficits. You know how much of the deficits are structural because so much of it is entitlements, defense, interest, not these things you can't cut. Um, and so those are just going to keep growing uh, at, a, at, a, at one clip or another. And then you can see not enough treasuries being bought. And then it's just a question of, okay, if we're running deficits, we have to balance that in the capital account. The way the Americans balance it in the capital account is via either tech stocks. We sell tech stocks to the world, which is what we've been doing really since 2010. Uh, I mean, you can see um, there's a chart in, in uh, the, the Fed Fred database that foreign holdings of equities has gone from like two trillion in 2009 to 12 trillion in 2020. Right. So I mean, it's they're, they're, we're they're, we're buying stuff from from China, and China's buying you know tech stocks from America. It's probably not a great trade in the long run, but that's what we've been doing, and so. If you then take away tech stocks or you start even, you're not going to take them away, of course, but on the margin, if the flows start moving away from tech stocks and capital globally starts moving towards oil and it starts moving towards industrials and cyclicals, um, 
but the price of oil and cyclicals and gold and all this other stuff is going to have to rise a whole lot um, to sort of balance those current account deficits. And, and so, you know, it's very possible we're just seeing sort of uh, a small move, you know, counter cyclical move. And that sort of the, you know, if the Fed is tightening and real rates are rising and the dollar is going to go up, that might very well be the case. And that's why I say I'm of two minds. It's, it's, um, it's still, it's still early. Um, I think it's too early to tell. And quite frankly, a lot of it can go, um, a lot of it can, a lot of it is dependent on what the Fed does, right? I mean, if the Fed comes out and, you know, let's say a real aggressive, say the Fed says, all right, we have a $9 trillion balance sheet and it's going to be back to 800 billion, like it was in 08 pre Lehman by the 4th of July. Well, dollars probably going to go up a shitload, right? I mean, it's, they're going to, they're, they're, there's just rates are going to go up. Dollars going to go up. Markets are going to go down. And so if that's your extreme case if extreme informs the means, uh, inform the means, then, you know, be, you, it's, it, it's, it's too early to tell, but I'm watching these two dynamics very closely. Um, you know, this dynamic of this, this isn't just a normal cycle. And then this other dynamic of, Hey, you know, if there's a sector rotation away from tech, the dollar could could have a bad year when everybody thinks it's going to have a good year. I just, you know, so, it's yeah. So with all that said, mm -hmm. okay, um, the the most popular question out of the hundred plus questions <laughs> that people posted on Twitter for this discussion, uh, this is what people really want to know: How much can the market handle in the fixed income, the sovereign fixed income, U.S. sovereign fixed income? What what percent can these yields get up to? Uh, before we're going to see a, another deflationary fit thrown by the economy. So like the, the 30 year today is at 2.09. The 10 year is at 1.75. Uh, I'll throw out one more here. The one year is at 0.48. What do those go to before we start to see things really get wonky and you start to see equities starting to sell off, and and clearly we are in a deflationary bust at that point. What what do you think we're they're able to get these things up to? I, I, it's it's going to sound like a wishy washy answer, but it's it's but it's not. I think it's I think it's the answer is is that it depends on where the dollar is. So if if the dollar is here or higher, you're probably getting close to the levels where, you know, I think, and, and I think you saw that to a certain degree, right? Last week, I mean, last week was an ugly week, <laughs> um, you know, two weeks ago or three weeks ago, whenever it was, we had, we had a round to sell off some of it. And it was weird because you had some days where it was just sector rotation, you know, oil was up, but tech was getting killed. Uh, but, but there were a lot of days where everything was getting killed. Oil was down, tech was down, yields were up, uh, industrials were down, everything was down. Um, and so, I, I, I think with the dollar at 96, at 97, the dollar certainly at 100, we're, we're probably there um, now. Really? You know, I, it, we're, it, maybe, maybe not quite there, but close. I mean, I think we're getting close. I think that's what the wobbles we saw the last two, three weeks are telling you, that we're, that we're probably getting close that too. Uh, I think the yield curve where it's, you know, flat and, you know, flattening out um, is probably telling you that, that we're getting close. Uh, if you take the dollar down to, you know, I don't know, 70 on the DXY, let's say for, uh, you know, a big number that's not completely, uh, non-credible. Uh, if you take it down to 70 over the next 12 months, then I think you probably can, you probably can hit some of these numbers that, you know, Jamie Dimon and some of these other banks are talking about, right? We, we're going to, we're going to start normalizing the balance sheet and we're going to raise rates four times. Um, that, and just for context for people to get down into, to, to break 80, um, we haven't been below 80 since 2014 Yeah, on the DXY. Yeah. So in t today we're at 94, um, you know, uh, at the start of 2021, a year ago, the DXY was at 89 and today we're sitting at 94, kind of got up to what was the high here? 97, 97. Yeah. yeah. And it was, you know, all, a lot of it and really since May, June of last year, it sort of did not, if I remember right from, from memory, it, it sort of was range bound from January through May, June of last year. And then the fed came out and said, Hey, we're going to tighten more. Um, and the, and but, the dollar had a good second half. So, so for the dollar to sell off that much relative to all these other currencies, and let's say eighty. Let's let's say let's not even say let's say, let's say yeah, the let's dollar say, goes to eighty. Let's say the right. dollar goes to eighty. I mean, you're going to have to see extreme tightening 
for all these other currencies. So over in Europe, over in China, all these other places are going to have to have extreme tightening in their currencies in order to allow the dollar to, to, you know, uh, become that much weaker. Correct. You would think so. Um, you would think, or, or, I mean, it's a zero sum game. So if we're saying it's going to go down. Yeah. If we're but saying it could it's be a capital flow issue, right? It could be the capital flow issue we just identified, right? Well, we're in a recovery. The pandemic is becomes endemic. Um, who needs tech at 40 times sales, right? You can, when you can buy, you know, Parker Hannafin at, you know, whatever it's trading at right now, 10 times, you know, even that by, I don't even know. I've, I've, I've not looked at it. all. I know is it's a heck of a lot cheaper than, you know, sort of pretty much anything on, on, you know, it's sort of the NASDAQ and you've seen, obviously I think some capital flows out already. The average NASDAQ stock has, has had a really rough, uh, four or five months. Um, the, the only reason I kind of push back on, on that even being a potential is like Lynn just had a post today where she was talking about how over in China, they're, they're really kind of creating a much more accommodative policy over there than what we were seeing last year, which was probably the tightest ship being run from a monetary policy standpoint for for uh, 2021. So if they're easing and they're in, they're expecting the dollar or w we're having this conversation about the dollar following down, falling down to a, an 80 on the DXY. Like, I don't know. I, I just don't know that these international markets uh, could possibly allow for the dollar, the fall that, that far without them stepping in and saying, Oh, well, we're, we're going to, we're racing you and we're just going to try to debase just as fast and make our currency just as weak. Right. Like, and I think it would have to be, so it's interesting, right? Cause it, it, it would, if it's a capital flow issue, like we just talked about, right. Where suddenly money starts flowing out of tech into industrials, commodities, et cetera, it's going to be flowing out of the U S elsewhere. The dollar starts to fall. Now what's really interesting in all this is Everyone could be loosening uh, in terms of, of their, their policy at the capital flow issue that is cyclical, right? Based on the cycle of where we are uh, and, and the price investors, global capital is willing to pay for growth. They don't need to pay up for growth so they can, they can switch to value. Uh, and what's interesting in all that is because I, I agree with your point that these countries aren't going to necessarily want their currencies to strengthen per se against the dollar. But what will they be doing to try to fight it? They'll be buying treasuries, right? They'll be buying. And what does the Fed desperately need to have happen mm -hmm. if they want to taper? They're selling treasuries. Fed needs a buyer. Yeah. Fed absolutely needs a buyer. So it, it, it fits um, where if you had this, this cyclical capital flow, if the pandemic is becoming endemic, you sell growth, you buy value, you buy commodities, you buy emerging markets, you sell the United States, and the dollar falls... Uh, based on the capital flow issue, then foreigners are going to start buying a lot of treasuries as the dollar falls. And you can see very clearly there's an inverse relationship between the level of the dollar and and how many treasuries they buy. And once it gets too high, they sell a whole lot. And once it gets low enough, they start buying again. And so it's, I think, something that could work away from, I think it could be driven by capital flows rather than relative interest rates. Um, you know, it's a balance of payments equation, but Again, it's, it's, to me, it's, it's still very early to tell, but I, I, I could see clear to something like that happening. So your analysis involves a lot more variables and a lot more thinking than, than how I think about the answer to this problem. And I want to put a, I'm going to put a chart up here on the screen. If people are watching this on YouTube, I think they might be able to see the chart. If not, all I'm doing is just pulling up a bond yield curve and showing Luke the the uh, trend, the long-term trend of the bond yield curve. So here it comes, Luke. I'm okay. putting it up on the screen. Uh, I think you can see it now. Can you see Just it? Just want to screen share. I can, yes. So this okay. is our... So here's the bond yield, yield curve. curve. Yeah, yield here's curve. the yield okay. curve. And yeah. you'll, see, you'll see this line up top is really kind of the long-term trend, the 30-year trend. Right. And it's obviously sloping down and I'm just showing it off of the 30 year, all the other, you know, durations underneath of that, uh, would be slightly lower for where they were kind of peaking out on previous, uh, you know, mini cycles or whatever you want to refer them to. And so all I'm doing is I just keep this running, uh, trend line 
of of kind of where we're at across each of the durations and i'm looking at where they're intersecting and i'm saying okay well it looks like you could maybe have an inversion on the bond yield curve out here in july of 22 uh because that's where a lot of the lines start to cross over gotcha okay and then as far as just kind of like where would it peak out well um i guess it could stick with this the, this 40 year trend line that's up here above, like I would see that as a worst case scenario where, where like the 30 year could maybe get up into this range, like a 2.7 maybe, um, where it would maybe throw a fit, but I'm with you. I, you know, I follow this, uh, this analyst here. I'm going to stop sharing my screen. If I could figure out how to do that. Here we go. Um, hopefully I'm back. Yeah. Uh, I follow this analyst uh, from Fidelity and he puts up incredible charts and he's, he's saying something very similar to what you're saying, which is you're already seeing the market really struggle to handle the yields we're at even right now. Um, and that you're, you're starting to see the credit markets really kind of sputter and uh, stall out and maybe, which, which is really interesting because going back to that chart, I'm not going to pull it back up, but if you go back to that chart, you can see we are deeply under that 40 year trend of how high those yields would sell off to. And for people that might not are, aren't familiar with bonds that as the yields go higher, they're selling off. Um, people might not be, uh, realize like there's, there's, there's a whole lot more to go on that trend line compared to where we're at right now, but yet the markets are already like acting like they're going to throw a deflationary fit. Right, which is the last thing they can afford to have happen. I mean, it, it's... Um, which is I, why you're saying they shouldn't raise rates. They should raise rates. They should let inflation run hot. And it's it's becoming a political issue, which is, you know, a, I, I struggle to remember the last time our politicians were right about anything. About how, how do you think it's... So I don't see it necessarily as a political issue. Help me understand why you think it's a political issue. I, I think the Democrats are seeing their midterm numbers, and I think they're scared to death. Uh, you, they're looking at the president's they, approval rating. So they want it to stay low. They, yeah, they're still there. And I think the Republicans are being opportunistic and saying, well, all right, uh, we have something we can hammer on them about. Look at, you know, I mean, they, you're starting to see, you know, the, the Joe Biden, I did that sticker show up on gas pumps all over. And, and, yeah. and, and so I think that, you know, it, it's, it's very cynical on the part of the Republicans and it's, and it's politically dumb on the part of the Democrats because you actually have, you know, working class wages rising above inflation for the first time in like 20 years. Uh, yeah. And it's been happening for like three months. And so um, I, I completely agree with every point you're making. How how inept does this show you the central bank is that we just had a 7% CPI print? Everything on the yield curve is selling off like crazy and your federal funds is pegged at zero. Right? I think they're doing what they have to do. Like it's, it's, it's but you we've know, never I, seen that before, Luke. We've never seen we've never, them we've, not yeah. move when this blowout. Not since after World War II. No, and and it's they the 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 U.S. is facing a very similar problem that Germany was facing in 1931, which was okay. You know, without the baggage of having hyperinflated eight years before. Um, they had these very onerous war debts. They had these high debts period. They had spent a bunch of money domestically on things like stadiums and stuff that couldn't possibly earn the foreign, the foreign um, exchange to pay back the notes uh, that was owed in foreign exchange. Um, and they had these war reparations that were in an inflation adjusting currency that they couldn't print. And in the same way, uh, the U.S. has all the debt and it's got the war reparations and in, in which are entitlements. And a lot of them are they don't owe dollars. They owe health care goods and services. Right. The Fed can't print. And so there's a lot of similar. You know, we just lost a war, the global war on terror. Um, you know, we saw us pulling out of Afghanistan and et cetera. Uh, you're in sort of this great power competition with China. Uh, the Germans were deindustrialized by war and by by war reparations. You know, the Ruhr Valley was seized by the French. We voluntarily shipped the quorum of our uh, industrial base to China based on a, a, a short sighted uh, mistaken trade policy, uh, ill advised trade policy, shall we say, uh, in the long run. Uh, and the punchline is, is that in 1931, the Germans faced a choice. They could either inflate and, uh, you know, serve, you know, basically keep the domestic voters happy 
or they could run austerity on the domestic on the domestic populace to try to keep the external creditors happy, but they couldn't do both. And the U.S. is and, and the Fed's in the same position where um, they they should be letting inflation run hot. They should be screwing bondholders. They should on a real basis um, and capping yields. You know, somebody has to pay. Either the bondholders pay in real terms or the bondholders pay in nominal terms via austerity. We write the debts down and. Ultimately, the Germans uh, did it via austerity and, and the political fallout from that, you know, the world paid for for the next 15 years with uh, the rise of the Nazis and Hitler, et cetera. Anyway, that's not to say we're going to say, but it's the same dynamic that we're seeing here. And, you know, I had this thought uh, as I was getting ready for the interview, when you talk about, you know, what's the Fed doing? I, if I really think the, the measure for people at the Fed people at, uh, in Washington should be, do they want the job? And if they want the job, they shouldn't be allowed to have it because they're, they either don't understand what they're walking into. I mean, it is going to be like a disaster or they're a sociopath and they want the job. And, and, and the, the, the fact that they want the job show proves they're a sociopath. The, you, what you want are qualified people want to be like, I don't want anything to do with this shit show. I mean, they're literally like here, here's a stick of dynamite. Uh, you know, you'll make, 180 grand, and then you can get rich on lobbying after your 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 you know your 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 service is done, and and so I it makes no it, sense. It makes no sense. So the Fed, you know, the Fed is doing what they can. I don't blame the Fed. The Fed is is managing an unmanageable situation. No I mean, doubt. they have to do the same thing that Germans in 1930. I mean, there's literally a section of the book 1931 where they where the the, the Chancellor of Germany Brüning says. The plan is we're going to tell the domestic audience that we're not going to pay the war reparations, and then we're going to tell the foreign audience that we're going to that we're going to pay the war reparations and implement austerity. And the problem, of course, is the internet didn't exist back then, so you could get away with that for a while. Now, yeah, big time, you can't you can't you can't tell our the bondholder like it's in the markets instantly. So it's yeah, it's this fundamental disagreement. That, that's unresolvable. You have to make a choice. It's this riding two horses with one ass analog. I keep, I keep referring to, and then you lay out questions about that, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And then you overlay the, the, the resource stuff, the China water stuff, the cold war stuff. Uh, I mean, it's who would want to manage through this? Like yeah. you, you either have no clue what's going on or you're nuts. Yeah. Hey, I, you mentioned something earlier that I really want to go back to sure. uh, because this is something I just don't know that much about. And I'm really curious. Uh, the China water problem that you brought up, and then you said it turns into an energy problem. Start really, really take us down the path on this to help us understand like what's inherently driving this, this water issue. And if you do have any good resources for people to read up on, because I know I'm curious uh, if you have any recommendations on that, but explain to us. In layman's terms here, what's going on? Yeah, so there's a gentleman named uh, Gopal Reddy who really has furthered my thinking on it. Uh, brilliant guy. Um, and we've, we've talked a bit. Um, R-E-D-D-Y is how you spell his last name. Uh, and he wrote a piece. You can find it online. It's public. Um, it, it's a, it's a, an issue near and dear to his heart. And he is um, standing on the shoulders of a uh, gentleman uh, whose name escaped me. He's a British gentleman. I think he's a former member of parliament and he wrote a, pe a piece as well about China's water issues in 2018. And I, my understanding is the, the British member of parliament, the British gentleman was for his troubles asked not to come back to China for, for publishing that. Um, now Chinese have written and talked about this. You can find it in the, I want to read it now. You know, <laughs> it's, it's, it's incredible. It's eye opening. And so, so the issue ultimately is really, um, it's structural. Um, the Chinese don't, a lot of the populations in the north, uh, they don't have a lot of water. Um, the rivers have been drying up. It's, it's, it's sort of a pop, fundamental mismatch. Uh, they don't have enough water to start with. Um, uh, climate change or whatever, the water supplies that they do have are shrinking. The, the aquifers they've been drawing on, they have been drawing on way in excess of replenishment rate. When you talk about replenishment of aquifers, you're, you're talking in terms of tens of thousands of years. Um, so it's not like, you know, you can just sort of stop drawing on it for six months and it fills back up. It's not how this works. Huh. Um, and the issue is that if 
when you've got a power grid set up, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to mess this up, so take this with a block of salt, but when you have a power grid, you've got base load and you've got swing power, you usually, your hydro stuff is really good sort of base load power. It's as long as the waterfall's going, um, the turbine's going. And, and so when you start having rivers get too low, um, you start I got it. Knocking off hydro base loads, and then you have to make up over here. Uh, you, you know, everyone here is, God, look at all the nukes China's putting on. Nukes use a lot of water. Uh, coal uses a lot of water. And so this water issue had been identified by the Chinese, by this British gentleman. Uh, uh, Reddy wrote a lot of, Gopal wrote a lot about it as well. And, and I think the, the brilliance of what Gopal Reddy has done has been tying it into recent events where he's pointing out, look, in, in 3Q21, we started seeing the Chinese shut down power plants ostensibly for environmental reasons. Now, when was the last time the Chinese cared anything shut about that? They don't give a shit about the environment relative to their economy. They have always been about when it comes to economy and environment, the economy wins full stop because they're worried about political issues if the economy slows. And yet here we have in 3Q21, these oddities that they're shutting down power plants for the environment. Here in 4Q21, we have Apple being asked to shut down factories for the first time in decades in China for lack of power. Yeah. They're having power outages. You had the Bitcoin mining migration. The bit, he and Gopal made the connection where he, Gopal said, look, he, I don't know. He goes, I don't know this, but it's very possible that this wasn't about, hey, we don't want competition for the for the central bank digital currency. Although I'm sure yeah, that's yeah. at least part of it. it. It's probably at least partly like if you don't have enough electricity, the first thing that gets thrown out are the mining rigs because, you know, you can't shut off Apple. You can't shut off your factories. You need water for your people. Uh, desalination is extremely energy intensive and maybe slightly positive, and it's going to be long lead time. Um, you're, you're having this water Every is endemic to electric power and, and electric power is endemic to China's economic growth. And China's a factory of everything. I know a lot of people maybe that aren't Bitcoiners that are outside that space would hear, you know, the comment that I made about uh, the power being the issue and not necessarily the competition in the in the monetary space and roll their eyes and think, yeah, right. But everybody that I talk to that are hardcore miners and people that are really connected to what what was happening over there from a mining standpoint said it was all about energy. The whole what's it really the whole thing for them to move over here was because of the the uh, demand that they were putting on the energy grid. Yeah. And that, that, and that makes sense. So then, you know, more recently in December, um, it was, um, it was Shenzhen and, uh, Guangzhou, right? So you're the number one tech manufacturing region in the world. And one of the biggest manufactured goods regions of the world, uh, there were articles you can find them online. They were asking their citizens to start rationing water. And so there's this sort of, you know, monster in the background, right? That's sort of like, you know, Jaws at the beginning of the movie that is sort of like mauled a couple people and we haven't seen the shark, but you can sort of see the outcomes of it or, or hints of the outcome of it. And to me, I mean, the, the, the implication of this, we could take this wherever you want to go. They're enormous. Um, what does, what does, uh, I think the, the big question everybody would have is what's ready think the timeline is before this really starts to uh, cause major issues, not just kind of uh, shark sightings. And I know, you know that's the hard thing to answer. It's a hard thing. I, 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 the short answer is, is, is within a couple of years. Like it's, it's the fact that we saw what we saw in the third quarter, these fundamental inconsistencies, uh, the Bitcoin, yeah. the shutting down of factories, Apple. If you're going to tell Apple to stop running stuff, there's a problem, right? It's a big problem. Yeah. Right. You, you, you're going to tell a lot of people to stop running stuff before you tell Apple. Tell Apple. Um, and so, you know, again, it's one of these situations where it depends on how things go. If they get a whole bunch of rain, um, then, you know, you know, this thing could get pushed out for years. If the weather goes against them, like this could be a problem in 2022, later 2022. Yeah. And, and, and importantly, and that's why I, it's, you can take this a lot of different ways. You can take it to the most extreme. 
which is interesting and, and I think important to think about, but I, for me, I try to boil it down to something that's more investable in the short run, which is. I love following the stock market and learning about investing concepts, but sometimes I fall victim to information overload. That happens to you too, right? Hundreds of news headlines from CNBC, Forbes, and Twitter all pulling for my attention every hour. How are we supposed to know what's important when everything is made to seem important? Thankfully, you can simply read our free newsletter. Our newsletter only takes about five minutes to read per day. We curate the most important topics in the financial world each day and deliver them straight to your email inbox for free. Join over 30,000 readers now by simply clicking the link here on the screen and then entering your email. It's that simple. Just click the link here on the pop-up on your screen, enter your email, and start knowing what's happening with your money. Overwhelming consensus is that we've seen peak supply chain disruption. And if China's got water problems, th there's like zero chance we've seen peak supply chain disruptions because supply chains are stretched thousands of miles all the way back oh to China. We've yeah. seen how complex they are. You miss one part and everything shuts down and China doesn't have enough water. China doesn't have enough water. These supply chain shortages are, are, are going to continue. They're going to become endemic. And when they become yeah. endemic, you're going to get an inflationary mindset. Companies are going to go from running JIT to doing what they did in the seventies, I'm told, which is you order as much as you can. And actually carrying inventory starts to be an asset on your books. Every quarter you write your inventory up because it goes up more. So there's, it's a very dangerous situation. It causes more of the same. More of the same inflation. Yeah. About which the Fed can do absolutely nothing unless they want to crash the economy. In which case they still are going to produce more water in China. It's not going to friggin' matter. Um, all they're going to do is cause political disruption. So it's, that's why I say if. if if someone wants to be in charge of this parade, they either don't know what they're wishing for or they're a sociopath. It's, 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 it's really an interesting time, um, you know, because the Fed can't tighten enough to fight this without blowing up the bond market with the dollar where it is. I mean, it's, they're stuck. They, they don't realize how stuck they are. Um, while we're talking about China, Evergrande, is there anything new that you've seen pop out of that or any other comments that you think have kind of come to light now? I've not seen anything, you know, particularly, and, and I'm, I'm, you know, there's probably about a hundred guys you could have in this, in the hot seat that would, that would be more value added than okay. me on it. Hey, so today zero hedge, uh, had a comment that they posted. They said some, t uh, let me make sure I'm reading this right. Some are terrified about balance sheet drawdowns yet forget that banks have literally handed 1.5 trillion in excess liquidity back to the fed via daily reverse repo ops. And then they said. Fed can drain 1.5 trillion with zero impact on net flows. I sent this over to you. I said, Luke, help explain this to me uh, I, in an easy and understandable way. Uh, I think everybody who listens to this show knows there's reverse repo going on. And I know there's, there's other very smart macro thinkers out there that are talking about this uh, reverse repo being able to uh, net out the flows. Right. What the hell does it mean? Explain it in a way that anybody listening to this show right now can understand what in the world all of this means. All right. So I just toggled over here. Hopefully you can still see me, but I just toggled over here to my answer to you when we were talking about it earlier, because I want to make sure I read it properly. So, um, and again, there are some, there, there are a bunch of plumbing guys who will be able to know the ins and outs of this way better than me. I've been focused on it very much from just a, uh, general flows. So I understand sort of it from a T account basis. So, so here goes, here's, here's what, what we were talking about earlier. So fed creates reserves when they do QE. So the fed gets the treasuries, the bank gets reserves. And once reserves get too high, uh, according to Basel three banking regulations, uh, the banks can actually have too high a reserve. So banks then have to basically cut back on their balance sheet. It basically, once the fed does too much QE, it actually reduces banks' abilities to grow loans. Is this, so, so, so let's just think through the logic. So is the, as, as the Fed is taking a bunch of money and buying bonds off the market, they're pushing all that liquidity into the hands of the banks. Right? Yeah, they're creating reserves. It's a swap. I, I think that we'll swap. say it's an asset right. swap. Those, I think that's right. Is they're, they're giving the banks you know, reserves, which are basically 
bonds of very, they're not 0% yield, but they're, you know, it's, it's reserves that, you know, very low yielding, zero duration asset, right? Uh, and the, and the bank and the Fed are putting the treasuries on their balance sheet. And but, so, but, but the, what they're doing is they're capping the amount that they can allow the banks. So if I'm a bank and we're, I'm, I'm engaging with you as the Fed in this swap, let's say you give me a thousand units. We're just going to keep this really generic. You give me a sure. thousand units and you've capped me at a thousand units uh, relative to how many loans I've lent out. What's, what's the ratio, this Basel ratio that you're talking about? You know, it's, it, it's, it's, I don't know the number that that is, but it's basically the, the biggest banks in particular have, um, based on the size of their balance sheet, have to have so much capital and reserves count a certain way. And the gist of it, the, the, the important gist of it is, is once banks have too much, too many reserves, uh, and I don't know what that is, it's defined per Basel three relative yeah, to the yeah. size of the bank and the balance sheet. Uh, once they have too many reserves, they have to stop growing their balance sheet elsewhere. So basically, you know, once QE gets beyond some maximum point of marginal utility, there's actually declining marginal utility for the economy in total, uh, because at first it's taking bonds off the bank balance sheets and freeing up reserves so the banks can make more loans. But See, taken too far, they end up with too many reserves and they actually have to constrict the amount of loans they make because they have too many reserves. And I. I don't know the logic beyond that other than the Basel III is trying to make the banking system more stable post, uh, post 08. It almost seems like it's a, uh, like a flag or a, a valve that kind of pops or like a circuit breaker that pops to back to the fed to demonstrate to them that they're, they're pr providing too much liquidity into the market. Like the, the market can't handle the amount of liquidity that's there because they're blowing over these thresholds and they have to keep them within a certain amount. Would you think that that's the, the rationale I, for having that cap or that limit there? No, I think it's, I think, I mean, it's almost like a dual corridor system, right? Where you can have too little reserves, you can have too many reserves. And I think I, I this is my view. I think that what Basel is trying, has been trying to do the Basel three rules has been basically trying to prevent, um, They've been basically trying to move this, tr trying to prevent uh, central banks and the domestic banking system from being used to finance deficits. I think it's basically sort of, um, it's a gold standard of sorts, um, you know, a hard currency of sorts where um, basically I think they've been trying to prevent the central banks and the and central banks forcing the domestic banking system or cajoling, regulating the domestic banking system into financing deficits ad infinitum. It's it, it hasn't really worked per se, but it sort of has, right? Because we've seen repeatedly, right? The repo rate spike. People say, well, that was that was just a plumbing issue. No, that was that was them bumping up against this constraint. And in the same way, this would be bumping up against the constraint. So I guess you know when you look at it that way. Yeah, it would be saying, hey, Fed, you can only QE so much. If you want you QE a certain amount, we're going to start penalizing your bank's ability to lend. It's going to hurt your economy. And then in theory, you have two options. You can go back to the Congress and say, listen, you're spending too much damn money. You either raise rates to get more people to finance it or you start cutting spending. Um, and the reality is, is what the Fed did is they did this reverse repo program to basically circumvent the whole thing. And so what reverse repo does, right? So again, Fed QE is Fed gets a treasury, bank gets a reserves, reserves get too high, banks have to cut back on balance sheet. Reverse repo temporarily swaps reverse repos, the treasuries that the Fed just bought back to the banks. And then the banks temporarily Profit. give the reserves back to the Fed. So literally just reverses the transaction they just did. But they're getting, but they're getting fees on this. Um, I don't know. Not, I mean, I'm sure, fees, I'm sure there's a, yeah, I'm sure there's, there's know, a I'm sure small, there's, there's a diet. small, sure. yeah, there's a small, uh, when I say fees, I'm saying yield, they're getting a small yield from the fed as they put them on deposit. Correct. But I, but here's the bigger deal is my understanding on very good account from people that know the plumbing issue back and forth is that these reverse repos are not on balance sheet for the banks. So it basically. Oh, okay. Okay. It gets rid of the balance sheet constraint. Okay. And so, um, 
this reverse repo balance, you're seeing, um, you know, it's interesting. You go back to when did the reverse repo start to blow up? The reverse repo balance started really to blow out last April when the SLR, the supplementary leverage ratio um, exemption for treasuries that was put in place April of 2020. And that came out and said, hey, banks, you can buy as many treasuries as you want. It won't count against this Basel III capital constraint, right? So um, that temporary exemption ended in April. Uh, of 2021. And basically, if you look at when that ended and when the reverse repo balances, when that thing ended, that SLR exemption, reverse repo balance was at like zero. And it went from zero to two trillion in eight months, months you know, because yeah. it was a two trillion. End. And so this is basically just an Enron like accounting creation, right? If you go back to Enron, right, when they, at the end of every quarter, they would like move the barges off their balance sheet, right? They'd like re repo the barge to Morgan Stanley. And so at the end of the quarter, it was on Morgan Stanley books. And then it would switch back to Enron's book. So it looked like Enron had more cash and liquidity than they actually did. This is the same kind of transaction. It's just when the Fed does QE, they get treasuries, bank gets reserves, reserves get too high and start to weigh on bank ability to make, lend make loans. Um, uh, there can be a capital charge if you, get, if you get too high, right? Increased capital charge once you get too high above capital thresholds or um, uh, reserve asset thresholds uh, in terms of the size of your balance sheet. And so then the Fed does a reverse repo, which temporarily reverse repos the treasuries back to the banks. Banks temporarily give the reserves back to the Fed. But it's quote unquote temporary. Yeah, it's, right? yeah, it's just quote unquote Meaning temporary. Meaning it can come back to the bank again. Right. And, and, and it should, right? It's a repo. It's, it's, a, it's a reversing transaction, but you just yeah, kind of keep for, doing it over and over. Well, I guess, okay. So the terminology they say is the zero impact on net flows in the short term. And right? I, I but in the long with term, that conclusion, like, because, yeah, no, I agree. I agree with you, but it, yeah. It, so it's, it's net zero for that time interval, that very short duration time interval that you're looking at because it went over there and it's sitting back at the fed, but the bank can still claw those back if they fall within the, the balance sheet constraints. So is it, it's actually still there, right? Like it hasn't, it's not like it just disappeared into oblivion. When right? I think right. zero hedges comment too, was in regards to you know, QE taper, right? Where the Fed can taper a trillion and a half before anything bad's going to happen. And that was my under reading of yeah, it. I, I think, think that's, right. I think that's totally wrong because if you look at, you know, just, you know, by reversing the T accounts of it, right? Is if you, is that if you reverse the reverse repo, then the reserves go back to the banks, treasuries go back to the Fed. So then the banks have reserves with which they can buy treasuries. Uh, but in, in theory, there is a constraint under Basel III that is still there, right? So yeah. in theory, yes, they're right. They have the, res the reserves, I will come out of re the reverse repo back to the banks, and then there's all this money, in these reserves, and in theory, the banks can buy treasuries. However, there's a constraint for too much reserves. There's also a constraint for too many treasuries because that SLR exemption uh, expired. So if- and, and you're assuming supply chains aren't going to continue to do what they've been doing, and you're going to have all these constraints and physical reality outside of, you know, number entries in the ledgers. Right. And even just setting that aside, right. If, if, if now, if, if, if the fed came out and said, we're going to, we're going to suspend the SLR rules again, as it relates to us treasuries, banks, you can use all those reserves and buy up treasuries. Then the zero hedge comment that there's a trillion and a half in liquidity to buy treasuries as the fed sells them. Yes, that's absolutely. I, I that makes sense to me. I can't say it's absolutely the case because I would defer to the the plumbing experts on that. But from a T account perspective, that would make sense. If the SLR rules for treasuries are not suspended again, like they were from April twenty through April twenty one, or uh, through March twenty one, then what Zero Hedge said is I don't think correct in terms of no net flow implication because whether the banks have the reserves or not is they're, they're not going to buy the treasuries because the constraints on the balance sheet will exist with the reserve levels where they are, even if they're out of reverse repo and bank got back on bank balance sheets, if that makes sense. All right, let's move on to something else. <laughs> this stuff, this stuff is just, you just want to gouge your eyes out. Seriously. Because it's, it, because it's just, uh, there's, there's a loophole that's created for a loophole that's created for a loophole. And meanwhile, you've got so many zombie companies that are being created because of these policies, right? I think it's we, the easiest way to think about it is, yeah. is the U.S. has a balance of payments problem, which is we're running deficits. 
They're structural. We really can't shrink them. And foreigners aren't buying enough anymore. And they are basically doing everything they can to sort of keep the balls in the air of changing bank regulations and liquidity regulations. And, and, ba- and so if you start from this point of balance of payments problem, and they're going to do anything they can to make sure those balls stay in the air. Yeah. That's what's happening. It's a classic emerging markets move. You've seen it in Argentina. You've seen it any, any country in history that's had a balance of payments problem. That's, that's what we're watching. Play. It's just yeah. very, you know, it's a lot of sexy language and it's, you know, it's, oh, yeah. that's what's happening. Yeah. Uh, okay. So more sexy language, uh, yield curve control. So when I'm looking at yield curve control, it, for the most part, it's not being implemented. We're watching all the durations sell off in fixed income, except for the federal funds rate, which is being kept at 0%. So you could make the argument that the, uh, that the bond market is quasi free and open, even though they're doing all these swoopy things that we were just talking about. Um, but. I think if we go through another big deflation, I've been calling them deflationary fits because the, what happened there in March of 2020, I think is going to be kind of the norm moving forward is we're going to have these big deflationary fits. They're going to step in with just arm loads of quantitative easing. I think on the next deflationary fit, you're going to see UBI used a whole lot more than what was used in this last round. Um, and I think that when you get into the next round, you're really going to see u- uh, yield curve control being used for people with the, the, the fancy name here. Yield curve control is you're pegging a yield. Let's say we wanted the 10 year treasury pegged at 1%. If anybody steps into the market and tries to sell it off and raise that yield above 1%, the central bank's going to step in and be a buyer for every single one of those sell orders in order to continue to keep the yield. Uh, pegged at 1% or lower. So I think on the next deflationary fit, that is going to become a very real uh, policy that's being, I, I was going to use the word uh, you know, implemented, but I think maybe abused is probably a better word to, to throw out there. And maybe across multiple durations, if not all durations, are you going to see them really kind of uh, finagling these, these yields. Do you agree with that, Luke, or are we way far off, uh, from something like that happening? Are we multiple deflationary fits away from that happening? You know, I, I think we are, and I'm sure I've said it before to you in in prior conversations is, is yield curve control is the hotel California, right? Once they check in, they can never leave. And so I, I think they will do everything they can to avoid yield curve control. I would argue we're in, and we've been in a, a soft form of yield curve control, yield curve management, shall we say. Um, they're happy to let it move around as long as it stays in between, you know, it's like bumper bowling, right? It's, it's you know, yield curve bumper bowling is what they're doing. Um, and we know that because we can see how quickly they hop to it when the repo rates spiked, right? That took them 24 to 48 hours that, you know, it was the ball rolled into a couple lanes over and they quickly ran down the lane, grabbed the ball, put it back in the lane. Right. And how do they do that? They did that by growing the balance sheet, right? They, they did not QE. Um, the, in, in the same way, we're not in yield curve control, but you, you know, this argument that, Hey, there's plenty of demand for, for, for treasuries to me, it's disingenuous when the Fed's balance sheet's sitting at $9 trillion. You know, the release valve has been the Fed balance sheet. Um, and, and so I think your point is on in terms of as we get these inflationary downdrafts, whatever caused them, whether it's um, over tightening or it's some sort of external factor or whether it's, um, you know, a bond market sell off where it gets trickier, right, is, is, is the inflationary side of things um, where uh, if, if, if it's cyclical in terms of sort of this recovery, if the pandemic becomes endemic and things normalize, okay, that that's one issue. If it's, you know, peak cheap energy and metals and Chinese water and power constraints and so ongoing supply chain issues, which I think are very likely to continue, um, that's, that's a different animal because now you're going to be talking about, um, CPI that's probably going to run seven to 10 for the next two, three, four years. Um, and that's assuming we don't try to reshore stuff that assumes so, 
there's no inflation associated with ESG and climate change initiatives, which is a joke. There's going to be a ton of inflation with all those things, right? So it's, they've got to do something to keep, you know, we know the bond market can't withstand levels, interest rate levels at a certain level at a certain price of the dollar, right? So if, if they're going to, and you, great, ex, yeah. you expertly sidestepped the answer to that and, and. <laughs> will they ever point. do it will they ever do it sorry i, I i'm going to try to be better about that so okay so here we go will they ever do it i think ultimately they'll be forced to uh i think it will be the last thing they want to do uh i think if i'm in their shoes i would much rather continue this uh yield curve management this yield curve bumper bowling because it's the key is as long bumpers as you, just keep getting tighter and tighter, they keep right? getting tighter and yeah. tighter and tighter. And they're eventually yeah. they're going to intersect, right? They're going to, they're actually going to be intersect. Pegged. Yeah. yeah it's and be that's pegged. where it's, yeah. And, and so, you know, how quickly will that happen? It depends on what happens with inflation. It depends on what happens with growth. It depends on, on a number of factors. Um, yeah, that's, that's, um, you know, they, that's, that's how I'd answer that. Okay. Um, I had a person ask, what if Saudis break petrodollar fully or partially? And, and then the person online wrote, they already sold their treasuries. What are your thoughts on that one? Um, I think we are already well along that route. Uh, I mean, I've heard very credible rumblings. I heard very credible rumblings 18 months ago that the Chinese and Saudis signed a deal. Uh, that the Saudis would sell some oil volumes to China in yuan or dollars, China's choice. Uh, I don't know that that came to fruition. I don't know that it's done in any volumes. Uh, I mean, there's a big meeting where all the foreign ministers of the GCC nations are flying over to China like next week or something, right? Now, what do you think? They're, they're not talking about the Kardashians and, you know, who, who should be a quarterback for the Jets, right? So, um, The Chinese or the, the, the Saudis are ultimately going to have to do uh, what they must to keep their biggest client happy. And their biggest client by far is China. Um, and so I think it's inevitability and inevitability um, that you get some sort of concession in terms of China being able that the Saudis selling oil to China in Yuan. Then the question becomes, do we ever hear about it? And if there's, and, and if we do hear about it, what are the implications? Because will it show up in, you know, in theory, I would expect the Saudi real would probably fall pretty sharply against the dollar maybe. Um, and if the Saudi real fell against the dollar, then, um, you would expect to see the price of oil. So, you know, Saudi oil would actually, their cost base would fall, right? Their costs are in URLs. They're selling in dollars. Those are pegs. So, but they would see, you know, they would have, they would be able to even further lower their cost bases relative to the world's oil. So in theory, it would be a deflationary impact for global oil in dollars on one hand. On the other hand, um, it's hard to know what the, the market implications would be for dollars. I mean, it would, it would make concrete the multilateral system where suddenly going forward, the world would no longer need to hold dollars for oil. Uh, certainly not the Chinese, certainly not, you know, others, uh, other big players, they would be able to pay in their own currency. And going forward, that means that as the U S emits these deficits, which can't really be cut again, because their entitlements, defense and interest. Uh, primarily, um, the, there'd be a lot of dollars being admitted, um, and there would be a, a significant step down in foreign demand because everyone could pay for oil in their own currency. They wouldn't need to stockpile dollars as much. Uh, and, um, then, uh, the fed would have to, would have to pick up the slack. Right. And so as the fed buys those bonds, we've seen, but we know for, we know empirically when the fed buys 60 to 100% of issuance, the dollar goes down. We know that because we saw it last year. We saw it from, from March of 2020 through April of 2021. Um, so structurally, it'd be really bad for the dollar. It might actually be good for the dollar in the short run. It might be bad for oil in the short run, but I think it's an inevitability. I think it's probably, you know, underway, probably has been underway for close to five years. 
how many, so back to the Fed, how many hikes uh, do you think they can actually get through? If any at all, they're going to hike, right? I think they're going to hike, yeah. I think they're going to hike too. Um, how many can they get in in 2022? The, the forecast right now is what, four? I think the forecast is three, but you've got people saying four. You're four. starting to say four. Um, I know Goldman was out saying four. I think JP Morgan was out saying that there's going to be four. And then Powell testified and said, we got to keep inflation uh, rates low. <laughs> All in the same week. I think... I think they could do the three or four. And I, if you would have asked me this two weeks ago, I would have said, there's no way. Oh, really? Uh, See, I, I agree with you. I think they can. And uh, why, why, why'd you change your mind? I, just watching what this dollar's doing, right? Watching oh. this, this capital flow angle of if uh, we're going to go from- myopic. <laughs> if, if we're going to go, you know, it's increasingly looking like we're going- um, from, from pandemic to endemic. And you can see it in the data. You can see it in the political responses. Everyone is backpedaling in Washington on this thing now. Uh, and I'm not going to get into it more than that because it's a political hot button. And neither you nor I need that kind of a, a heat. <laughs> That's so um, true. Uh, it's a shit show. Uh, but if we go pandemic to endemic, we continue that the capital flow movements, I think, are going to weigh on the dollar, maybe in a very pronounced way. And if they do that, if we continue to see the dollar fall, then the more the dollar falls, the more ability they will have to actually raise rates. And so it's interesting is it's possible that what we're watching is the Fed not, you know, the way to think about it is, is not the, how much is the dollar going to rise on the Fed Titans? It might be the right way to think about it is, is what we're watching with Fed tightening is them slowing the rate at which the dollar falls. It's basically their foam in the runway for how fast the dollar is going to fall as we go from pandemic to endemic because of the capital flow out of the United States into areas and assets um, that are not big tech. So I'm just pulling up the chart, the DXY chart, uh, so people can see what we're talking about when we're talking about the dollar. Um, so I have it in a monthly bar, Luke. I think it's better to look at these things in longer time frames when you're talking currencies. And then I have the MACD uh, here on the chart and mm -hmm. you can see that you're actually getting, uh, it's looking like a little bit of a rollover here on the MACD. Now this, this bar hasn't closed out. You got another 18 days for that to close out, but um, you might be right, Luke, you might be right on the, on the momentum there. Um, I just wanted to kind of pull that up so people could see it. Yeah. So, I mean, to answer your question, I, I that, that's, to me, it really is, is a function of the dollar. It's really, um, the more, the lower the dollar goes, the more room they have. And I think they, I think they know that. Right. And so it's been very interesting to me to see what gold has done. Right. Because if I was the fed and I wanted the dollar down, if I was the bank of international settlements and I wanted the dollar down, cause it's in everybody's interest for the dollar to go down. Like if the dollar goes up, this whole thing is going to implode, right? We are going to get a lot more than an inflationary or a deflationary, you know, uh, tantrum. We're going to get, you know, an implosion. So everybody needs the dollar down. Now, if I wanted the dollar down, one way I would consider doing that, I would, you know, get someone like the BIS bid in gold every day. You're right. Which sounds conspiratorial, except yeah. it does, it, you know. Except they have a trading desk. And if you read on the New York Fed website, you can see and the, the exchange stabilization fund, uh, you know, has a, has a, you know, the ESF has a mandate to maintain orderly markets in FX uh, by buying foreign currencies and gold. Their words, not mine. Right. So if, if you get gold just marching up, you know, that, that, that can sort of create a framework to sort of try to get the dollar moving in a direction that everybody, everybody oh. needs it to go. Huh. Do you, so when you think about the BIS, do you think that that's one of their, uh, main things that they're, well, instead of framing it that way, tell us your point of view of the BIS. I just think of it as a central bank or central bank. Um, you know, I, there's, there's a great article in the wall street journal from 2012, I think it's December, 2012. Uh, and I remember the article, the name of it, it's, it's inside the risky bets of central banks. You can look it up. Huh. 
And it's a fascinating, fascinating article to me because I frequently hear, oh, there's not some small committee that gets together and it's not the way the world works and it's a conspiracy theory and okay. The article in the Wall Street Journal says that every six weeks, central bankers accounting for 55 to 65% of the world's gross domestic product get together in a room in Basel, Switzerland with no notes, with no meeting minutes and talk about in plain language what they, what they want to do. And so I look at that and I go, okay, do you think they're talking about the Kardashians and who should be starting a quarterback for the Jets? Absolutely. Or, <laughs> right? And so, so again, I, I think it's cynical. That's the pregame. That's the pregame. <laughs> right? So it's like, okay, there's six guys in a room who are made, you know, like, I, I think, I think they are acting in the best interest of the system. I'm not one of these, oh God, they're trying to, you know, sort of, you know, take over mankind and want to rule the world. I think they are acting, trying to act in the best interests of the system from the standpoint of, look, the system imploding is in nobody's interest. Um, I think they are trying to basically just manage what has gotten away from them in terms of global economic growth and the debt and, and all this stuff, right? So I don't think they're sort of like this evil committee of the world, um, you know, but by the same token, like, again, read the Wall Street Journal. There is zero chance that 10 guys in a room, no meeting minutes that control, you know, that are the central bank, oh, yeah. two thirds of global GDP are talking about the Kardashians, right? They are talking about, okay, what happens if the dollar rises? Well, this will happen and this will happen and our economy will tank. Okay. Then we can't have the dollar rise. Okay. How do we keep the dollar from rising? All right. Well, we will, you know, tighten policy this way. That's going to make the dollar go up. What are you going to do? Oh, like, don't. Those are the conversations they would have to be having. They'd have to be having those conversations. Yeah. That's how I think about it. So global cooperation among central bankers is really. Yeah. And the article kind of says that. It says, you know, basically then a, a forum where they can bounce ideas off each other. Right. Um, you know, uh, not an easy flight. Right. I mean, you get on a plane and fly for eight hours to Switzerland. I mean. You're there for two days and fly back. Like, again, they're not going there. They, you know, they would do the Kardashian stuff over Zoom. I mean, that Luke's got Kardashians on his mind. Um, <laughs> final question. What do you think of Bill Miller's uh, portfolio uh, this week that came out? I saw a headline about that. <laughs> now, I'm going to say this. Bill's a friend. I, I consider him a friend. I don't know if he considers me a friend. I consider him a friend. Um, and he, I would argue he probably has one of the best risk adjusted returns over a lifetime of a, a very long time in the market. What, I don't know. What's he up to four decades or something in the market. Um, he probably has one of the best risk adjusted returns of anybody that I've ever talked to. Um, and for people not tracking the announcement, he said he has two things in his portfolio. He has 50% Bitcoin and 50% Amazon. <laughs> so, I mean, this is, this was really bold. This was huge. And then we had Ray Dalio who, who made the announcement that was circulated on our show on the investors podcast network that 2%, he, he finds it appropriate to have 2% allocation in the Bitcoin. So it's kind of a Bitcoin question. Any thoughts on, on some of this stuff? Does it surprise you at all or that you have such massive names? I mean, Bill Miller, I mean, the CIO of Leg Mason itself managing 80 billion, you know, two decades ago. Um, and that's what's in his portfolio. I, I think it's, I mean, to your point, the man's record speaks for itself. I mean, he's, he's, he's a legend and, and he's brilliant. I think it speaks to, when I saw it, it speaks to, I think a greater recognition amongst people sitting in senior seats that realize that the Fed is trapped, that they realize basically, right? There's always two things in investing is the end game and how you manage your chips along the end game. And I think it's just a sign that people in senior seats are realizing a the end game and when you see aggressive moves like that either they don't have 
the mandate where they need to manage the chips um, in a more short-term nature, right? Which is the best place to be for something like this because, uh, you know, I think that's that's what we're watching, right? He, it's, it's if I understood it right, it's mostly his money. Um, yeah, and it's and so he can do whatever he wants with it, and he doesn't need to write a letter to shareholders in a month and or and in two months and and with the quarterly letter and saying, "Oops, you know, you know." We, we, you know, we just lost 1500 basis points of your money over the last three weeks in Bitcoin because Bitcoin's down 30%. Yeah. He doesn't give a shit because he, 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 the, the, the fiscal stuff is the fiscal stuff. The balance of payments is the balance of payments, these other issues. So as I look at it, it's a little aggressive for my taste, but it ain't, it ain't that aggressive for my taste based on how you see the world. My analysis of, of, of how this is all laying out for the world, yeah, but yeah. they don't have a choice. They're, they, and, and it was, it was interesting. I had a great conversation with, with, with Jeff Booth last summer. Um, and we, uh, um, at a conference and, and we were talking, was this the Bretton Woods? This conference? was the Bretton Woods conference. Yeah. 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 Right. So we're talking and the, 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 the gist of it. So someone asked him, it's like, okay, well, how, you know, if you've got this fundamental, this, you know, this fundamental disagreement between inflationary currency system, right? Where it's a debt backed currency system. So you need inflation to make the debt whole while Jeff, you're saying you've got this, um, you've, you've, you've got the, the tech's got this deflationary impact, right? And Moore's law is putting deflationary pressure. So you've got these, you know, it's the two horses, one ass problem. And the person asked Jeff, I said, this, this person said, how are they going to resolve it? And I interject that I just said, they're going to have to fully reserve the debt. And Jeff goes, they're going to have to fully reserve the debt. And for the audience, what fully reserve the debt means is that 70 to hundred trillion dollar Euro dollar system. No one knows how big it is. Everyone says it's huge. It's mostly going to have to go on the fully reserving the Euro dollar system means fed balance sheet, 70 to hundred trillion. And that's where this is going to have to go. And it's just the way it is. It's it. And so when you say you know, barring a productivity miracle, it's what's, what's likely going to happen. And I think that's what people like Bill Miller, when they put 50% of their money in Bitcoin and the other 50% in Amazon, I think that's what that bet is saying. I think it's like, look, it's my money. I don't give a shit if it goes down 30, 40%. And I, you know, they are going to have to fully reserve this thing. And I, this is, that's this is how game. I want to play it. Yeah. I think that's what he's doing. And I mean, he's, he's been in since 2015, so he can, he can handle a little volatility. Oh yeah, exactly. No, that's right. That's right. Yeah. He's, he's, that's exactly right. And I think it's important, right? I mean, I think it goes back to that chart you and I've talked about before of, you know, what gold did in Weimar Germany, right? So as, as the yes, currency is totally. literally going to zero in gold terms, right? Or gold's going to infinity in currency terms. There were four or five instances as the currency was hyperinflating and one of the great hyperinflations of all time where people were selling gold and buying German Reichsmarks. It was like, oh, it's different this time. They're going to tighten. The German Reichsbank's going to tighten rates four times this year, and they're going to taper QE. You know, they're going to stop. Oh, sell gold. Oh, God. You know, give me, give me Reichsmarks. Well, the math was the math. But what it speaks to is that managing the chips properly. You're Bill Miller. You own it in whole. You're, you're, you've got money. Like, it didn't, you know, the path was the path. Yeah. Be careful with leverage. Be careful with leverage. Yeah. Luke, uh, I could chat with you all night. I love these conversations because I, I, get to, I get to learn. I get to learn in these conversations and they're just so useful for me to kind of just really kind of wrap my head around the complexity of all of this. And uh, for po if, if people want to tap into Luke's knowledge, I say this every time we talk, but you have your two books there kind of in the back, Mr. Uh, the Mr. X interviews. And both of these books are so insightful. If you really want to try to wrap your head around his sight picture and how he sees the world, both of those books have been extremely helpful for me personally. Thank you. Um, I can't help promote those enough. Is there anything else you want to highlight or give people a handoff to or something interesting that you... Yeah, they can... No, they can always just check us out at the website, fftt-llc.com and, and see what we're up to there and, you know, our different, uh, uh, product offerings, et cetera. But, uh, no, I just, you know, I've got an active Twitter feed. I think, uh, everyone that's listening or most people that are listening probably, probably know that and, uh, you know, can check us out there, but no, it's, I appreciate you having me on again. It's, uh, I, I always, I always learn a lot talking to you. It, uh, 
it, it helps my thought process a ton. I really appreciate it. Yeah, absolutely. And boy, I had fun. Thanks for coming on the show. Absolutely. And happy birthday to you, my friend. <laughs> Thank you. That I'm not sure what happens to those profits or what they're used for. And I don't, I don't know if anybody does, to be honest with you. That's where they get really secretive about their internal operations. I know one of them is used for like emergencies to provide liquidity for, uh, you know, countries that go through financial crisis. But yeah, it gets mysterious once you understand like, where do these profits go? 